Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Feeding your pet boa constrictor appropriately is critical if you want to be successful as a boa keeper. But many boa keepers remain confused in this area. Today I'm going to provide a broad basic overview of all of the most important concepts in feeding boas. So stay tuned for everything you've always wanted to know about feeding your boa constrictor, but we're afraid to ask. I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys lately, and I always like the questions, so please keep them coming. But a lot of them are the same types of questions, and they're about basic aspects of boa care. So I decided I'm going to do a series of videos about the most basic aspects of boa care and try to wrap up the most important critical information in a quick, easy to watch episode. And these episodes will cover everything from feeding to uh, housing your boa to interacting with your boa and several other topics. So be sure to stay tuned to the channel as I release these videos about basic boa care. And so feeding was the obvious place to start because of the multitude of misunderstandings that people have about appropriate boa feeding. And there's so much misinformation out there. Part of the problem is a lot of the books, especially the older books on snake keeping, indicate to feed a boa once a week. And this is just too much. And so I have a basic feeding schedule that I recommend. And this is just a rule of thumb to start with. But in general, I feed my baby boa zero to two years old about once every 10 to 14 days. I feed my two to four year old boas about once every two to three weeks. And then boas four years old or over, I feed once every three to four weeks on average. I feed a rodent that leaves a barely visible bulge, not the largest rodent that the boa could possibly eat, but probably about two sizes smaller than that. So it just leaves a barely visible bulge and the bulge is typically gone within a few days. So this schedule is a starting point, but you really need to look at your boa constrictor's body shape as well as its growth to assess the appropriate amount of food it should be getting. So boa constrictors should have a very muscular uh, shape to them. They should not be fat. They should be quite square in cross section. The height of the boa from the belly to the top of the back should be about one and a half to two times the width. So it should be kind of flattened like a loaf of bread. And this is especially true for the true red tails like the Suriname boa. They should just have this nice uh, dense musculature and they shouldn't be round or fatty. A fat boa looks pretty much like a fat anything else. It's going to be much rounder. In the extreme cases it's even going to have rolls of fat and it's just going to have a generally soft and squishy feel to it. A uh, well-fed boa constrictor in good shape like this animal will be really muscular, feel kind of hard and muscular and not have this squishy uh, feel or appearance. The other thing that's critical is you should be monitoring your boa's growth rate to uh, determine the proper feeding schedule. In general, most boas will grow anywhere from 6 inches to 18 inches a year. So the uh, locality boas, like true red tails, in general grow on the slower side, sometimes as, as little as 6 inches a year. And some of the morph boas are my fastest growing boas and can put on about a foot and a half a year. So the boa should be growing slowly but steadily. If the boa seems to be growing too fast and expanding more than it is getting longer, you're probably feeding it too much. If the boa isn't putting on at least a few inches a year, you're probably not feeding it enough. So take the schedule and then watch your boa's growth. A lot of people think, well, I want my boas to breed. I'm going to feed them a little bit more. I'm going to get them to breeding size faster. And so you can grow a boa a little bit faster if you feed it more. The problem is it's not going to be a good breeder because it's going to put on excess fat. It's not going to have the right muscles required for breeding. And it's probably not going to survive as long either. It might uh, actually live half of the normal life expectancy of about 20 years. So you don't want to power feed your boas. You don't want to grow them too fast. But then you don't want to underfeed them either and grow them too slow. So uh, you're going for slow, steady growth for the best uh, health for your boa. The next boa feeding question I get a lot is, which do you recommend, feeding rats or feeding mice? And I will say both, depending on the life stage of the boa and your situation. And so for my boas, I start them off on mice. Typically, the babies will get a fuzzy or hopper mouse as their first meal. And typically, I'll keep them on mice for about 
a year and a half to two years before they get their first rat. And so I've read a lot, I've, people have expressed that uh, a lot of opinions in this area, some people claim that rats are better for feeding baby boas, others claim that mice are better for feeding baby boas, and it comes down to the fact that a lot of baby boas, especially the true red tails, are prone to regurgitation syndrome. And so some people claim that baby rats fed to the boas are less likely to be regurgitated, others indicate that the mice are less likely to be regurgitated. So what I found is that when you're feeding a baby boa, you would have to feed it a younger rat that's going to be the same size as a slightly older mouse. So like a, a pinky rat would be about the same size as a large fuzz or a small hopper mouse. So the mouse is a little bit more developed. It's got more fur and connective tissue uh, and less fat. It seems like the fat in the rodents can lead to the regurgitation, especially if they have milk in their bellies. So in this instance, I would say that I would prefer feeding a slightly larger or slightly older mouse than a younger rat like a pinky rat. Other than this, I think either one is going to be fine. You know, it really has more to do with how the rodents were raised. You want rodents raised on a quality, healthy diet. And you know the nutritional analysis of rats and mice varies depending on where they're raised and the strain of uh, rodent that you're talking about as well as the diet. So really there's a lot of overlap. I would say that uh, feeding both rats and mice can be appropriate and typically I feed mice until about a year and a half and then I start feeding uh, a small rat is typically the first rat that I feed my rodent, my uh, boas. And for a while, for about a year, basically I'm feeding both kind of on and off. Once they're about four feet or so, they don't eat mice anymore. And they're fed a diet of probably about 75% rats. But I also feed them some birds, uh, including quail and chicks of appropriate size. So I would recommend that you mix it up. You might want to feed your boa about 75% rodents, but they like the birds as well and it adds you know, other nu nutrients. It's always good to mix it up both for their uh, psychological and their uh, physical health. So while we're talking about regurgitation, I get a lot of questions about this and this is one of the most uh, frustrating things that boa keepers can experience. It's especially common with true red tail boas if they're not kept appropriately. The animals will regurgitate or vomit up the uh, partially digested food item typically about three to four days after eating. And I actually did a video going in depth on this, so check that out if you are interested. But the three most common causes of regurgitation are feeding too frequently or too large of a prey item, keeping the temperatures too hot or too cold, or rough handling shortly after the animal ate. Uh, so if you avoid those, hopefully you can avoid regurgitation. Unfortunately, once the regurgitation sets in, it's really hard to get out of and animals will often succumb and end up dying you know, after a few regurgitations. The next topic I get asked a lot about is whether I recommend feeding live or frozen thawed rodents. And so this is a pretty easy answer. I would say 99% of the time I recommend feeding frozen thawed rodents. And there's a number of advantages of this approach over using live rodents. It's a lot more convenient for the reptile keeper. You don't have to worry about live rodents escaping or smelling you know, or taking care of them. Uh, it's also much safer for the animals because the rodent, uh, you know, a, a dead rodent isn't going to attack your snake. And I've seen these really ghastly pictures of, you know, these poor ball pythons and boas that just have been hacked to pieces by live rats that were left in their enclosure. You know, if the, rat, if the snake doesn't eat the rat, the rat can turn the tables and eat the snake. And it's just uh, really uh, awful what has happened to some pet boas. About the only time I would recommend feeding a live uh, prey item to your boa is for a baby boa when they're first starting out. And so typically I'll start my baby boas off on live prey items. Especially with some of the island boas, they just won't take frozen thawed prey items as their first meal. But then after a few meals, I'll try to switch them over. Some of the island boas and dwarf boas, like this craw key boa, will insist on eating live for about the first six months or so before they'll take a frozen thawed prey item. Most of my other locality boas and morph boas, they'll eat the uh, frozen thawed prey items 
it's usually within the first you know month or two so it's really not hard to get them to eat some people have asked me well what about the normal behavior of snakes hunting and don't boas need to hunt you know to feel to be healthy psychologically and this is just ridiculous because the boas don't really even understand the difference between live and dead okay they're just attacking the uh, prey item because it smells like food and it tastes good um, in fact when you dangle a uh, frozen thawed rodent in front of the boa's mouth typically they'll attack and they'll constrict so they think it's alive because they're trying to kill it so there is no uh, psychological manifestation of treating the frozen thawed prey items the boas like them just fine uh, nutritionally they're also equally acceptable to the fresh prey items with the exception if your prey items have been frozen for over a year they'll start to go bad nutritionally so you should try to feed you know fresh prey items which have been frozen within the last year the next piece of basic feeding information is the decision about whether you should uh, raise your own rodents and breed mice and rats for your boas or you should just buy the frozen thawed from a supplier either a local breeder who is breeding them as uh, feed items or one of the national suppliers that ship the frozen rodents uh, directly to your door and so there's some misunderstandings a lot of people have this idea that they can save a lot of money by breeding their own rodents and the truth is it, usually you don't save a lot of money sometimes you don't save money at all breeding your own rodents and then you have to invest a lot of time and you have to invest a lot of money in the equipment and a lot of inconveniences about breeding rodents so i think for the vast majority of people it doesn't make sense to breed their own rodents uh, you can do your own cost analysis and determine just how much it would cost breeding them versus buying them and in fact i did a video previously on this topic so check that one out if you want what i'll say for myself i only breed a few tubs of mice and that's so i have a constant supply of live mice of appropriate size for feeding to my baby boas i don't breed any rats and you know the part of the problem with the mice is they take an inordinately large amount proportion of my time to take care of them i probably put you know for each tub of mice i probably spend you know three or four times as much taking care of it than a similar size uh, tub with a boa in it and honestly i'd rather use the space for uh, more enclosures for my boas rather than the rodents then of course there's the smell of the rodents as well as the fact that they do escape occasionally which is always a source of friction with the wife so i would recommend that you do your uh, calculation if you live in an area where you have lots of space you have lots of time and you you know can put in the work to breed the rodents it might make sense for you but for most people it really just doesn't make sense another question i get about rodents is what supplier do you use to supply your rodents and is there a supplier you recommend so i don't recommend a specific supplier i actually use several of the major national suppliers depending on availability and i found that they're all equally acceptable i haven't had any really negative experiences if you look on the internet there's a lot of people who write up really negative reviews about some of these rodent suppliers and i think they have had a bad experience but then they kind of amplify it and they're looking for a bone to pick and it just kind of gets into this nasty you know thread of people you know making all kinds of claims about these rodent suppliers and all the damage that they've supposedly done to the people's snakes and i gotta take these claims with a grain of salt you know one of the most common claims is that the rodents have feces and urine in them and they're not really well packaged and so i've seen um pretty commonly that rodents will have a few feces remaining it's just part of the you know rodent production process they're producing lots of rodents. They can't remove all the feces. And sometimes there's a little bit that kind of oozes out after the rodents are packaged up. And in general, it's really not a big deal for the snakes. It's not gonna cause them any you know, health effects or anything like that. Um, so you don't really have to worry about it too much. I have noticed that people or different rodent suppliers package the rodents a little differently. Some people just uh, put them in Ziploc bags and they're kind of you know thrown together sometimes they might uh, freeze into each other so you have this kind of chunk that has like three or four rats in it that are kind of all wrapped together other rodent suppliers will 
neatly packaged them in styrofoam meat trays that are shrink wrapped. And so the presentation is nicer. Um, but again, I haven't found that the other suppliers that don't make this nice presentation uh, really have rodents that are that much better. Typically, the suppliers that have the nicely packaged shrink wrapped rodents will charge a little bit more. So I would recommend that you try several suppliers, decide which one you like best, and then stick with them because you really need a constant steady supply of rodents if you're going to be keeping and breeding boas. Another question I get asked an awful lot from uh, boa keepers is that their boa won't eat and they want advice of how to make it eat. And I actually did a video on this topic so check that one out. But I'll just say that boas in general are really really good feeders. In fact my boas almost never will miss a meal. Uh, they're unlike ball pythons and some other uh, snakes. These boas are a species you just really don't really need to worry about them not eating. So there are exceptions. So sometimes if a snake has inappropriate husbandry conditions, if it's kept you know, too cold, uh, it's not gonna eat. Frequently the cause is that you're feeding it prey items it's not used to eating. So you should really check in with the breeder or supplier of your boa uh, about what prey item it's eating. Make sure it's eating, by the way, because some unscrupulous breeders will sell baby boas which haven't eaten yet. And for example, with some island boas, it can be a little bit tricky getting them to take their first meal. Um, the other issue is that sometimes boas will insist on live prey. And as I mentioned, sometimes baby boas uh, that haven't been fed a frozen thawed prey item yet will want a live prey item. Um, so if you have a boa that hasn't eaten and it's been a while, you know, at least a month or two, then I would suggest check your husbandry conditions, make sure the temperature and humidity are right, make sure it has enough hiding places, and try offering it a live prey item. And the majority of times, the animals will eat under those conditions. If your uh, boa goes for more than a month or two without eating, uh, I would suggest definitely to seek veterinary advice and to have it checked out by a vet to make sure that there's nothing medically wrong with it. A few more feeding related questions I get a lot and one of them is about feeding your boa in a separate container and there's this um, misunderstanding that the best way to feed a boa so that it doesn't associate the feeder with uh, food and it doesn't attack the feeder is to remove the boa to a separate enclosure, offer it the food in the separate enclosure, and then move it back to its home cage. And so I never do this. I do not recommend doing this for a number of reasons. So typically after you've already thawed out the prey item to put into that second enclosure, the scent of the prey item is gonna be in the air. It's gonna be on your hand. So when you're going to move your boa to the secondary enclosure, chances are it's going to smell the prey item and you might get bitten. In addition, if you feed your boa in that secondary enclosure and then move it, there's a chance that the physical act of moving it could end up in a regurgitation, which of course we don't want to have happen under any circumstances. So I would definitely recommend feeding in the home cage. If you're concerned about possibly being bitten when you go to pick your snake up the handle, what I would recommend is that you um, use either a snake stick to basically gently tap the tail of the snake or the you know posterior half of the snake just to let it know you're about to pick it up. Alternately you can use a snake sack or pillowcase just kind of drape it over the snake's head and then gently pick the animal up. And the animals will typically go into handling mode from the feeding mode if you just follow these steps. One last feeding related question for today's video, and that has to do with overwintering your boa and whether you should stop feeding it during the winter cooling period. So most breeders use some type of uh, cycling where they drop the temperature slightly, uh, especially at night. And this lasts typically for about two months or so from around December through January. Um, and that during this time they pair up the animals to breed. And also during this time, the animals are not fed. And so this isn't necessary for pet keepers who aren't intending to breed their boas, but pet keepers can still uh, do this and they can still withhold the food for a period of about one and a half to two months or so over the winter. And in fact, this is a good way to keep your boa in good shape. And if your boa has put on a few extra ounces over the you know, main year, 
during the winter cooling, it can shed some a little bit of weight and slim down a bit. So I would recommend that even if you're not going to breed your boa, that you do this winter cycling. Um, typically I start cycling my animals when they're about two to three years of age or the first couple of years I keep them at regular temperature and feed them year round. But then starting around year three, their, uh, their third winter, I will drop the temperature at night and withhold the food. And so you, the exact time that you do this isn't critical. You know, some people will do this for as long as three months. You know, others might do it for a month and a half. You know, so play it by ear. Um, but winter cycling is not just for breeders. It's also a good way to make sure that your pet boa stays in good shape. So I hope this video was helpful as far as some of the basic feeding information for your pet boa constrictor. If you enjoyed it, be sure to stay tuned for future videos in this series about basic boa care. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.